Hey guys! Sorry for little delay, we had experienced some technical troubles and now we hope you can see us. Please write if you see us. And uh, meanwhile, I would like uh, to share some of my personal data with you. My name is Katrina Dumas. I'm... Uh, <laughs> ura! So, so glad to see you, Alexander. Hello! So, uh, my name is Katrina Dumas. I'm IT lawyer, legal IT group, and this is my colleague. Yes, I'm Andrei. And we will start today talking about GDPR. We are so glad you could make it and you wait, waited with us. Uh, meanwhile, we were dis deciding our problems. And uh, now, I guess we could tell you a little bit more about our company and then proceed to agenda. What about it, Andrei? Uh, yes, thank you, Kate. Uh, I think, um, guys, our marketing department promised me to give a piece, a piece of cake if I save you a few words about our company. We are a legal IT group. Legal IT Group is a Ukrainian law firm which provides a full range of services for IT companies. As you could understand, the GDPR is our core specialty. We provide, uh, we, we had been engaged in a lot of uh, uh, GDPR projects for uh, European companies and for companies outside the European uh, economic area, such as companies from the USA and Ukraine. We took the first place as an outsourcing legal company on Clutch and we have more than 200 clients in IT industry all around the world. So Kate, what about our agenda? So let's see what we have for today. At first we will talk a little bit more about the GDPR, what is it, why we are talking about it even when we are situated in Ukraine. So then we will proceed to the main rules under the GDPR, you may encounter it every day if you are working as an outsourcer. Then we will talk about little, we will tell you a little bit more about the document log, what do you have to prepare and what do you have to include in your contracts. Then we will talk about the transfer of data between the, between the European Union countries, between the European Union countries and third countries and uh, especially about the member states itself and about the US and Switzerland. And in the end we will talk about a little more, bit more about more practical areas like uh, we will talk about uh, Germany especially. Andre has prepared us a really good case about the outsourcing problem and some cases will maybe quiz us on cases we will be squeezing here between, in between the lines. So let's start. Write us, uh, by the way, write us a little bit more about your experience with the GDPR. Have you been working on it? Have you prepared any documents? Have you encountered the regulation itself? We will be glad to see your experience. So don't shy and write in the chat. We are waiting for your questions and for your insights. Well, a little something about GDPR. Yeah. Well, uh, GDPR is a uh, regulation, as you can know. Uh, it has uh, it has been implemented instead of the directive, which was uh, the main source of data protection law in the European Union for late and for uh, latest twenty years, I guess. And uh, what is the GDPR in a nutshell? It's a minimal standard what uh, every country in the me every member state of the European Union has to observe and be. Like uh, we, we, uh, as we will talk about a little bit more later. Uh, the member state is uh, obliged to uh, take the GPR as a um, as a main guidance, but uh, in a nutshell, it's a set of standards. It's uh, the result of the long discussion between the privacy specialists around the world, not only in the European Union. It's in effect uh, since uh, 25 of May of last year, 2018. And now we can see that a lot of countries are taking its lead and uh, updating their privacy laws to adhere to this uh, minimal standard, which is pretty high for some countries. So, Andrei, yep. uh, what is your personal experience with the GDPR? You are working in the privacy area. Yes. Uh, as, as you have said, I'm a privacy <laughs> lawyer and legal IT group, and I'm working on the GPR for more than for more than one year. And you deserve your cake. Yeah? Yep, <laughs> I hope. So let's uh, proceed. Uh, we will talk. We have talked about the GDPR. Now we will proceed to the roles you can play. As you, uh, it it depends on the role you are playing in your contract. Like you, are you a customer who requests a service from the European counterparties? Are you uh, instead you are uh, 
Ukrainian outsourcer uh, offering your services so about the development, about the technical support and so on and so on. It means working with data. And if you are working with data, you have to adhere to the central rules established not only by your national law, uh, meaning the law of the country you are situated in, but the laws of your counterparty, often, oftenly, especially when it concerns the GDPR. So as you can see on the slide behind you, uh, the, liability, uh, the liability is meaning the role, like uh, depending on the role you are playing as a processor, as a controller, as a representative and so on, you will have a different, uh, different set of uh, uh, obligations and freedoms or rights. And I see that Alexander Pozniakov has experience with the GDPR. Oh, so glad. We are so glad you have it. <laughs> it was, was it pleasant or you were really disappointed with it? And uh, back and back to the role. Uh, what we are talking about is a controller. Uh, is the first well, the controller is a person who sets uh, purposes and means, and you can see that uh, the purposes and means of processing personal data may be uh, the liability in this role may be divided into different uh, kinds depending on your own and your relationship with other con controllers. Like if you are joint controllers or control control agreement, it depends on the role who's. Uh, which documents you have to develop, which policies you have to implement, and which contracts you have to sign. And uh, then, if you are working uh, as a processor, so you have an, a set of instruction from a controller, someone who uh, sets the role and goal, someone who uh, decides how to collect data and how to process it, what it needs from this data, and you are just working about processing it, like storing maybe, maybe processing like uh, having insights from it, and so on and so on. But you are a processor while you are uh, <clears throat> leading your, uh, not your leading your rules, but uh, you are obeying the rules of your uh, controller. And you can see that there is a different set of liability between the controller and processor, or between the processor and, and the sub-processor engaged by you. It depends on the special articles of the GDPR, it depends on the member state law, and you have to uh, be especially clear about it in agreements when you are uh, signing in with the controllers. Of course, the different, uh, the different roles, the different set of liability will have the recipient, uh, meaning this person who is only disclosed the personal information, personal data, uh, the representative, uh, in case you as a controller or the processor, you are situated outside the European Union and you have the, uh, and you have to deal with sensitive data, with monitoring, with profiling, offering services and goods on the territory of European Union and so on and so on. You have to appoint a representative who would, uh, who would be uh, your uh, working on behalf of you in the European Union. And of course, the police. What about the employees, Andy? Are they a different role from the controller processor? Or have yes, to... of course. But, but uh, the GDPR doesn't um, uh, doesn't uh, 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 meaning you said that they are uh, they are covered with the same contract and with the same yeah, yeah. law as the controller processor yeah. who are working for. Yeah. And Kate, I has uh, I have a question. Yeah, of course. What uh, role do you like the most in the GDPR? Actually, the DPO. DPO, why? <laughs> yeah, because they uh, are like a consumer, more like uh, not like uh, an ordinary employee who make um, make uh, make decisions about the, uh, certain areas of uh, collecting and collecting or processing of data. But the DPO is more a consumer. He will help you to develop your documents. He will have to keep in touch with the with the latest uh, updates in the law. But meanwhile, he must be independent enough from the firm so he can advise you with clear head. And your and your. I agree with you, DPO, because <laughs> I'm a lawyer, and the DPO is a good um, is a good perspective for for the lawyers to uh, as a workplace. For a and oh, think, oh, yeah. of course, oh, of course. So I guess uh, that's all for I have to talk about the roles and levels and uh, if I will mention the DPO and policies and uh, contracts, I guess Andri can tell you a little bit more about the contracts and policies so what had to be developed while uh, while processing your data. So uh, thanks, you, thanks, Kate. I think so. Now we have a general understanding of uh, the roles which your company play uh, plays in accordance with the GDPR. Uh, and now I think it's time to speak uh, something about your legal obligations. First of all, I should say that uh, Article 32 of the GDPR states that the controller and the processor shall implement appropriate technical and organizational measures to ensure a level of security appropriate to the risks, to the rights and freedoms of your data subject. 
Additionally, Article 24 of the GDPR uh, defines that um, the data controller shall implement data protection policies proportionate to the data processing activities. So, these two articles state your obligation to develop some GDPR documents. As we can see in practice, the paperwork is one of the first things that regulators, European regulators, consider during the course of investigations and enforcement procedures. So there is, for your IT business, always a necessity to analyze how you process personal data, specify the role of your company in data processing activities, and specify the list of documents should be developed in your case. Oh, I have a question. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, how do you think can we develop only one uh, i mean only one document log for a company and then apply to all our processes no or not. maybe we can find them somewhere in the internet some something like tell it just for us uh, no i think that uh, the list of documents and the content of documents shall be determined on a case-by-case -case basis uh, i think the best the worst idea uh, is to use um, documents from templates from the internet Why? Be because the data processing activities it depends on your business process and your business model and uh, so on oh, okay so Thank you. so we are continue and um, i'm going to tell you about some about paperwork so in our company, we divide all GDPR documents into three main groups – policies, procedures and other documents. Policies uh, states the, states the uh, main uh, statements that should company uh, – that explain how your company processes personal data. For example, privacy and personal data protection policy, controller processor agreement policy and so on. Procedures. The procedures uh, states the, uh, st the steps should your company take in order to deliver the provisions of the policy in real life, in real daily activities. Uh, for example, uh, personal data mapping procedure, privacy notice procedure, etc. And at last, other documents. Other documents are usually used to, uh, to meet the special requirements of the GDPR. For example, contract review tool. The contract review tool is something like a spreadsheet that uh, uh, help you to track how you uh, modified contract with your business partners in order to meet the requirements of the GDPR. But the GDPR is not so easy as you could think and only policies, procedures and other documents are not sufficient to, to reach to achieve the GDPR compliance. So, Shaya, what do you have in your toolbox, in your professional toolbox, when you are helping IT outsourcers to develop their documents? What do you recommend them? What documents do you have to offer them? Um, the indicative number of uh, it's not a, 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 the indicative number of document is from 30 to 40, and uh, as I said before, it depends on a case by case basis. But uh, so. Uh, Every company should analyze their business process and after that only define the list of documents should be developed. I agree. So, uh, contracts. Uh, one of the most important prejudices to reach the GDPR compliance is uh, the explicit contractual provisions or just contracts. Uh, you, uh, in, your outsour in the outsourcing relationship, you ca can conclude a special data processing agreement or include data processing clauses in your outsourcing contract. Uh, the data processing agreement is a contract to be developed between the data controller and uh, the data processor, between two data processors or between the data processor uh, and sub-processor. It, uh, it regulates the data processing activities and uh, states the subject matter of the processing, uh, the nature of the process, uh, processing, the purposes of the processing, uh, of course the types of personal data and categories of data subject, and of course the rights and obligations of the parties. But the GDPR states a list of uh, provisions to be included in your data processing agreement. For example, acting under the controller's documented instructions. Uh, uh, it is important that any contract 
uh, uh, that any contract define who is in control over the personal data, because such a person will be authorized to give written instruction regarding data processing activities. Or we have a question for yeah. our lawyers. So uh, Anarman uh, asks us, do we need to have all this paperwork? Isn't it hard? Is it never necessary to write so hard, to start to try so hard? I think uh, uh, GPR compliance is always a hard thing because uh, you need uh, a lot of documents and you need a big uh, expertise in this sphere and it in this case in this sphere uh, cannot exist and univer a universal decision to, to, to reach the GDPR. But compliance. is it checked by someone? Do you have to hand in to some authority or to some I don't know somebody to check if your documents are all right or you have to just lay them in the in the case and wait for the occasion? No, you sh you you are uh, under the GDPR. You are obligated to conduct an internal audit and to check uh, regularly your your GDPR documents. Oh, this way. So I'm sorry for interrupting you. Where are you? It's fair enough. Uh, the second provision is implementing appropriate technical and organizational measures, taking into account uh, a big role of uh, privacy in the context of the GDPR. It is um, wise for data controller to assess the expertise of your services providers. And we recommend you include in your outsourcing contract uh, the requirement that the suppliers are obligated to assess what is appropriate to protect the personal data. The third provision, for example, is employee reliability. In general, uh, the reliable employees and uh, subcontractors are a part of organizational measures to protect personal data. And in the context of IT outsourcing relationship, we highly recommend you include in your data processing agreement uh, the provisions that the employees and uh, subcontractors of your service providers uh, have obligated to pass appropriate training with regard to data protection and information security issues. It is very important and other data protection obligations. Uh, the supplier shall not engage another processor without prior authorization, or uh, the supplier is um, obligated to assist you in ensuring GDPR compliance, and, and so on. If you, need a more, um, if you need a full list of provisions to be included in your outsourcing contract, please uh, read Article 28 of the GDPR for more details. So, uh, we will guess, I will ask our listeners, have you written, have you signed, have you ever have any, any dealing with uh, GDPR contracts or the contracts which include in the data protection clauses? Write us about it. We would like to hear about your experience. And maybe we will can advise you on something or something like that. So, uh, I guess we have talked about the contracts, we have talked about the GPR in a nutshell, we and, and we decided uh, we decided which role depends, uh, which liability depends on your role, and, get, and I guess we can so switch to the transfer side, the, the data, the core of the outsourcing works, of the core of Ukrainian outsourcing world in a nutshell, to the transfer uh, of the data outside the EU. Uh, even despite that Ukraine has signed the, uh, the as you know, uh, the agreement with the European Union that we will try to unify our law to close it, close up. But now we can uh, still um, say that Ukraine is not uh, in the white list of the GDPR data protection uh, jurisdictions. Like if there is no executive decision about the Ukraine and so on, we have to work really, really hard and tailor your contract and your model, business model in, in especially, to the transfer of the European data from your European counterparties to Ukraine and, uh, and uh, vice versa. So what about the transfer? What does the transfer means? When you are working with Ukrainian outsourcer, even if uh, you are working clearly in the internet, but uh, physically we can decide that the personal data has crossed the board between the European Union and Ukraine. And in this way, even if even so you're working in the internet, which can uh, be said, we can on, on, uh, often be heard that there is no borders and no jurisdiction in it, but de facto it is. So uh, we have to work about the compliance and transfer really, really hard. So what about the transfer? Can, how can we uh, cross this 
uh, imagine a board of, uh, of between the EU, EU and Ukraine, uh, EU or other jurisdiction, like uh, other, any other country which is third party to the European Union, and uh, be in compliance. So, have you worked with transfers to the EU or vice versa? Oh yeah, and uh, especially in our key outsourcing relationship, I think it's a, it's a big problem. Oh, I know. We worked often with it, and it's yeah. it's it's quite hard. It's quite hard to to to, cha to change the model or to choose the perfect model for you, especially. So, what about the transfer? How can we transfer it? What have we choose from? Uh, at first, uh, if there is no adequacy decision, adequacy decision is uh, a decision adopted by the co by the Commission, uh, which clearly states that the country in question has the data protection law really clearly close or even better than the European Union has. And in this way, the European Union uh, considers this jurisdiction as a safe harbor for their data, data and they entrust this country with the, uh, the data of their citizens. So an adequacy decision clearly states that you can transfer your data to this country or uh, inside or outside uh, without any any borders, nor paper, nor uh, physical, nor, nor even uh, uh, like I mean, liability. So the next step we can uh, choose from, if there is no adequacy decision, is a model clauses or a standard contract clauses, how it's now called. It's a set of standards you have to include in your data protection, data protection uh, contract, which will actually, which will be um, marking a line that uh, the your obligations and the obligations of the European Union controller or processor in the European Union can trust them your data and trust you their data are the same. So they can be uh, they can sleep calmly about uh, your confidentiality and about the personal but that being safe in your country. So uh, the next way we can uh, uh, the model calls the standard call calls to you, they are uh, either incorporated in the contract or attached as appendix. It depends on the situation, but usually it's uh, off, you can often see the DPA so place it somewhere on the website of a big processor of a big controller. So you can sign it and find that you are in a contractual relationship. Oh, we have a question actually. So are you ready? It's great. Yep. So Natalia Tkachenko asked us, hi Natalia, uh, have you revised the following situation? Company calls data in Ukraine, but has virtual server decided in the data center in some EU country. And so such data is deemed to be processed in the territory of such EU country. To my, uh, as Natalia thinks, in accordance with the Article 3.1 of the situation, a British Ukrainian company is to be compliant with the GDPR. Mm -hmm. But uh, she sees that a lot of companies from Ukraine run such service somewhere in the European Union and they don't even care about the GDPR. Mm -hmm. What do you think about this? I think, uh, Natalia, the place of processing of personal data doesn't matter in the context of the GDPR. But if your if Ukrainian company offers services or goods within the uh, to the data subjects within the territory of the United States, in the only in this case the GDPR will apply to your situation. But what does it mean offering the services in the, GDP in the EU? What does it mean? It's, uh, this, uh, this, ter uh, this, uh, this term has a very wide uh, interpretation in accordance with the GDPR and uh, uh, if our listeners want to, uh, to, want to uh, know and want uh, to about want to know about this um, uh, about this term. I recommend you to read the guidelines on the territorial scope of the GDPR. You can find all needed information in these guidelines. We will give you a little spoiler when you are offering services and you target your website on one of the on the member states, yeah. for example, when you have uh, when you are offering to buy something from your website in a currency applicable to this jurisdiction, and maybe if you are monitoring the behavior of the special Mem members uh, population of the member state, then maybe you will have to care about the GDPR. Who knows? Who knows? You will have to explore it. So back to the transfer side, the EU. We have the binding corporate rules, which means that you uh, have a company, which uh, cons uh, company group, which consists of uh, little companies, um, for example, around the European Union and even outside the European Union. You have to set a one single standard to data processing, uh, which would uh, 
uh, which would be obliging uh, all of these companies. And this usually have to be at least approved by the uh, data authority, from leading data authority of the board, depending on your situation. And uh, the same is uh, for codes of conduct. When you have, a, a, for example, an association in some sector of the economy, which will decide how the personal data typically are processed by the members of the association, they can write little codes of conduct, which will, which uh, adherence to which will help you to show that you are compliant with the GDPR. And uh, the other thing is the privacy shields, and we will take this a little yeah. bit more. Yeah. And of course, we have Article 7, uh, 49 derogations that uh, clearly means that uh, in case you have a consent to transfer your data somewhere from the European Union where it's protected to the uh, risked country or is the jurisdiction or you have uh, a really really uh, good uh, reason to transfer like a public interest like uh, uh, legal claims like uh, loss use uh, started somewhere outside or inside but have to be trans, trans transnational or you have to transfer the personal data of, of a person due to the vital interest and you can't obtain you cannot just because it uh, maybe it's a minor maybe it's an ill an ill person you have to to give this personal data of this person to somewhere because uh, it's a vital interest like uh, the question of life maybe so then you will you have to you have to be to be even more little more more claim calm about it because in case it's an ordinary situ is uh, uh, extraordinary situation is not a regular the ch tri flow of data you can transfer it and you can uh, uh, have a justification and justification for such transfer. So uh, I see one more question, I guess. So Marina says that uh, as an entrepreneur from Ukraine working for a customer in France, employees of some contractor under the GDPR. So uh, uh, as, I, as I can see, it means that the, the person who would be meant as a subcontractor under the Ukrainian law are working for a customer who is in France. Uh, and we have to, cons to consider them either employees or subcontractors. Mm -hmm. And which role would we choose in the document? Uh, I think uh, we need, of course, more details, but generally I think uh, that uh, entrepreneurs from Ukraine, if they have an access to personal data, shall be deemed as the sub-processors -pro sub, uh, sub, uh, in accordance with the GDPR. So clearly we have a chain of sub-processors, yes? Yeah, chain of sub-processors. And what we have to do in this situation? I th uh, the best way to regulate the chain of the processor is to use uh, explicit contractual provisions. Okay, so, basic, so basically you mean that we have to flow the obligation from the controller uh, to the first yep. uh, first processor and then yep. to the sub-processors, everyone who is in... Yeah, sounds who is, reasonable, yeah. Who is from the, all the sub-processors is uh, li liable for, yep. in case uh, someone from the sub-processor is breaching. Yeah, great. Well, then who is uh, liable? Uh, the liable will be, of course, the data controller. But mm -hmm. if uh, the uh, but if the violations of the GDPR was uh, was uh, was uh, made uh, after the violations of the processors of their mm -hmm. contractual provisions, in such a case, uh, the data processor shall be may, may be uh, maybe maybe may bear mm -hmm. the the the, the um, of course the. So uh, as I understand it. And you will correct me if I'm wrong. So uh, you're saying that in case you have uh, one leading processor and he is engaged in the sub-processors, yep. uh, he is a leading processor will be liable in yep. case of breach. Yep. So good, great. <laughs> Thank you. If the violations was met uh, as a result of actions of this processor. Of course, of course. Uh, so what about the foreign controller? Every time the sub-processor changes, we will have to wait a little bit more, a little longer, because we have a case. And we would like to hear your thing, your thoughts about this case and about this uh, informing obligation. So you will have to wait. We will come to be, we will come back a little bit later. So what about privacy shield? Yep, privacy shield. Uh, thanks, thanks, Kate. Now we have analyzed. Uh, we analyzed already. We have al already analyzed the transfer of personal data outside the European Union, and uh, I think that now we have an opportunity to discuss more specific question about the transfer of personal data.
to the United States of America. It's a typical uh, situation for the IT outsourcing relationship when the suppliers of services locate in the territory with the USA. Uh, in such a case, as Kate has said before, the GDPR prescribes that transfer of personal data uh, to such third country may take place where uh, the European Commission has decided that such third country provide an adequate level of protection. However, in accordance with the decision of the European Commission, the United States of America don't provide an adequate level of protection. Therefore, in order to enable companies on, on both sides of the Atlantic with a mechanism to transfer personal data, uh, the United States Department of Commerce, the European Commission and the Swiss administration designed special privacy shield frameworks. Uh, privacy shield framework is administered, uh, the main, uh, actually the main dates you can see on our slides. Uh, the Privacy Shield Frameworks is administrated by the International Trade Administration. It enables American company to, uh, to join the one or both the Privacy Shield Frameworks. So, to join this, uh, this, uh, uh, to join this program, American company uh, sh uh, will be required to self-certify and to, to make a public commitment to comply with the requirements of the Privacy Shield Framework. Uh, and uh, please be advised that uh, the certification is voluntary, but, uh, uh, but after you make a public commitment that you, that you will comply with the requirements of the Privacy Shield Framework, this public commitment will become enforceable under the United States under the United States law. So, which benefits can your company obtain uh, as a result of certification? The main benefit is that your company will be deemed as provide an adequate level of protection. So, in such a case, the provision of the GDPR, the requirement of the GDPR to transfer personal data to such third, to your business partners outside the European Union will be met. For example, imagine you are a European company which acts as a data, uh, which acts as a customer in the context of IT outsourcing relationship, or as a data controller in accordance with the GDPR. So I have to interrupt you. I'm sorry yeah. because when I was speaking about, the, I was talking about the controller processing DPOs. Uh, maybe I have misguided you guys, and I will uh, back to it later, so yeah. you will understand clearly what the roles are in this uh, process. So, who is a controller? A controller is a person, meaning a legal entity or an individual, who uh, decides uh, what data is to be collected, how it is to be processed, and have I forgot anything? That's all. That's all. And bears also less in the liability. Yeah, no, yes, of course. Yeah. <laughs> so the controller it's here. <laughs> so the controller is deciding what what data is to be collected again, how it will be processed, and write the instructions for the processors in case uh, the controller decides to engage such. Uh, on the other side, the processor is a person or a legal entity or an individual who works with this data entrusted to them. So there is a always a controller who have the uh, purposes and the data set. And we have a processor on the other side who works with the data which is uh, transferred from the controller or who is uh, collecting the data in, uh, according to the instructions made by controller. And uh, you have not been misguided because the processor always works on the instruction of the controller. Sometimes in IT outsourcing there is a situation when the controller means the supplier of the services often uh, acts like a, process, uh, like a controller. He, uh, he gives you a program, for example, or he gives you some uh, maybe uh, some real solutions to collect the data and you decide that he is a controller. But uh, you have to be more specific about it in the case you have any doubts about what role you play as a, uh, as a customer or as a supplier of the service uh, inside the contract. You have to maybe you have to uh, advise, uh, you might have to inform, um, you have to uh, look into the GDPR actually. The GDPR and maybe some guidelines issued by the Working Party 29 or from the European Data Protection Board. Oh, just ask us. We are open yeah. to you. We can always write us to the ace uh, at uh, legalitygroup.com 
We will be glad to answer you. And I, I think, I think the, the asking of your legal advisor, it will be always <laughs> the better option. Of course. <laughs> and what is the, who is the DPO? Uh, some, uh, it depends actually on the company. Sometimes it's an employee, sometimes it's a contractor who works uh, under the service contract. The DPO actually is a data, pro data protection officer. It's a person who works as an advisor. He uh, sees all the Mm, all the data processing inside the country. He, does, he uh, designs the documents to be implemented. He designs the policies to be uh, developed. He works with uh, uh, as employees. He works with the top management. And uh, in case there is a serious breach, I mean, uh, or any other security uh, incident, the DPO is the first person to tell you what to do and how where to go, to how to notify the supervisory uh, um, body, the supervisor body, to data subjects maybe, to media, to uh, some other stakeholders. So the DPO actually is uh, or is a, an employee who has to play as a role as a DPO. Uh, of course, it is not uh, interrupting his other duties. Or he is a subcontractor working in the service agreement who will help you to uh, understand what the data flows are inside your company and how to deal with it. Actually, in a nutshell, it's just like that. So I'm sorry for interrupting you. I hope it was more clearly now. And uh, we will back to the privacy shield from the Envisa USA and the Swiss. Yep. Uh, it's 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 okay, Kate. Thank so uh, we uh, we are going to talk about the ma uh, the main benefits uh, which your company gain as a result of certification in accordance with Privacy Shield framework. So the main benefit, as I said uh, before, is that um, uh, organizations uh, uh, participating organizations shall be deemed as provide an adequate level of protection in accordance with the GDPR, and in such a case. Uh, the requirement of the GDPR regarding transferring personal data outside the European Union will be met. Imagine you are a European company which acts as a customer in IT outsourcing relationship and at the same time as a controller in accordance with the GDPR. And you have service suppliers from the United States of America which had passed uh, which has which passed the certification in accordance with the privacy shield frameworks requirements in such a case the transfer of personal data to such business partners uh, doesn't uh, require any specific authorization for you in other words you will be free to transfer personal data without need to comply with special requirements of the gdpr so we finished i think we finished to to speak about the uh, international transfer of personal data, about transfer of personal data outside the European Union, and I'm going to, to say a few words about data flows within the territory of the European Union. So, uh, the main uh, changed, uh, change uh, of the GDPR compared to the previous data protection directive is that the GDPR is legal binding and applies directly to all member states without the need to be transposed into national laws. However, the GDPR states that in some cases uh, member states may adopt some specific rules. Uh, on our slide we can see the divergence of approach between the member states. So the member states may adopt their own rules for, for example, for regarding the data processing in compliance with legal obligations, or processing for scientific, historical, statistical purposes, or protection of personal data in the context of employment, employment law, and so on. Uh, taking into account that um, uh, IT outsourcing relationship uh, usually covers uh, companies uh, which is located in more than one member states, we recommend you to to, to determine which member states, uh, which um, uh, member states law may apply to your business operations, and to to, uh, to ensure that you and your business partners are familiar with applicable national laws requirements. So, Kate, uh, what yeah. about yeah? I think in the course of our webinars we focused on the uh, theory uh, issues, and I think it would be it would be a good idea to uh, talk about the practice cases, maybe. Oh, okay. So let's see the next slide. 
and we have the case number one. But before we proceed to the case, we have some questions. For example, Amans asks us, do we provide DPO services? I guess no. No. But we make all the, all the documents you will need to comply and we can help your DPO to uh, work further with your processes. We can help with consultancy and so on. So if you have this issue, please welcome. We will be glad to hear about your data processing. So, uh, and uh, the Alexander Holot asking us, is it okay if uh, he has only DPA with a customer, but no other mentioned internal documents? So basically, he has just a contract about the service, I guess, or uh, with an attached DP, uh, data protection agreement, uh, data protection addendum maybe, but no other mentioned internal documents, meaning no policies, no, no other mm -hmm. contracts and so on. Is it okay or there are some risks? No, dear Alexander, only data protection uh, agreement is not sufficient to comply with the requirements of the GDPR because uh, there is a lot of other obligatory requirements that you can uh, can you, um, that uh, state that is stated in the GDPR. Okay, but what are the risks? Why do I have to take so many time to write them and just to lay them on the floor, maybe on maybe on the table, and they are laying there for ages? I think the best risk is always a big administrative fines. It's, okay. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. Financial fines are really yeah. the most serious risk. So I hope we answered the question. Thank you for them, guys. Write them more. We will be glad to help to be a more to be a more talkative to you and to have a more tight contact with you. So write any questions you have regarding the DPS, the uh, DPAs, the DPOs, and so on. Hi, Francia. We are glad to have you here. So, 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 enjoy, I hope you enjoy our webinar. We will be glad to meet you later. So, back to the cases. <laughs> Alexander Holt, it's a pity, I know, but there are fines, what can we do? So, the case well, number one. So, uh, you can make a, uh, make a, uh, 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 photo of your, uh, of your screen. So, uh, the company A works with a payment processor. You all know them. It's like a way for pay, maybe, maybe some, maybe some other pro pro payment processors, but it's, it's still. So the hacker stole personal data processed by the payment processor, not by you, but in case your processor, I guess, and uh, including those belonging to the, your, your clients. So the first question is, to whom that a subject should send their complaints to? Write your answers to our chat. We will be discussing it a little bit later, so I we have given you like five seconds to write. So, Andri, I guess it's time to challenge our expertise. <laughs> okay. We have a serious data breach. Yep. And there are some our clients who paid for our for our services with the payment uh, through the payment processor, and their data will be stolen. Yep. It's a pity, but uh, should we ex should we expect any complaints to us? I think we discussed we discussed uh, this uh, some uh, something like this uh, case today. We no? always can <laughs> come back to that. Just to see one more. Maybe we changed our positions, or maybe our uh, listeners will say something interesting. So, um, as I said before, the, uh, the data pro processor shall be liable in accordance with the GDPR only if the personal data breach was occurred as a result of actions of this payment processor. In other words, the data controller can, uh, shall be liable in accordance with the GDPR. But is he always processor? Maybe he's playing some other role? Maybe he's... Maybe, uh, but I, I, I don't know all the details of the case. Sorry. Maybe do you help me? As I remember, we have one a client who ha who works with uh, worked with a payment processor, and uh, the payment processor was was even uh, he's just a recipient. He receives some aggregated data without any uh, without any special personal details given them by the controller, but they are uh, collecting them themselves for their purposes and so on, and they return the data to the controller just about the number of the account who was playing without the uh, even uh, even more specific data, so there is no risk to be data breach. So I guess so there is <laughs> wrong account, but that's what's true. <laughs> so I guess uh, it depends on the role. It depends on the model you're working with, depends on the contract and the services you are provided with by this uh, payment processor. 
and uh, we can proceed to the next case, I guess. So, yep. uh, I will tell the riddle, yeah? Yeah, So the company B, we had the company A, now we have the company B. Website is a, is a, has a privacy policy. You all you all saw them, especially after the GDPR. They are like arranged. So you, I, I'm sure you have read them at least once or twice. So in this privacy policy, the company B warns the customers that some data they disclose may be collected and processed through the API of their partners. So who is bearing the, the responsibility for this data? Who is the collector? Who is the processor? And who is responsible for the data breach on the side of this processor which works through the API? Uh, API? Uh, I think in such a case, I, I, again, I don't know, I don't know all the details, but I think in such a case, the company uh, which pro uh, collects and process personal data for their own purposes through the website will be act as a data controller, and uh, the business partners um, which process personal data through the integrated API will be act as a data, data processor. Maybe you have some other ideas? Actually, I would like to hear our listeners first. I'm waiting for your positions in the chat, and we'll be glad to hear more from you and uh, deciding why uh, what is the role as we decided around, uh, early as a controller, the processor, sub processor maybe, maybe the recipient, who knows, who knows. And uh, in this situation, we have uh, in a actually in a route, what we have, we have a contract, a service contract, yeah, I guess. Course. And we're working as a B2B model, yeah? Yep. So there is a shed to decide whether we are working with a processor, with our processor, and we are working as a controller, or maybe we're working with the controller control agreement when we have our, uh, our uh, decisions about the data set we want to, close, to collect and the operations we want to do with them. And uh, on the other side, we have such a controller on the other side, actually, who decides uh, on the purposes and the, on the amounts of the data to be collected. Who knows? Who knows? You have to see your contract to decide well, how to, this, to map this data flow, I guess. But still, I don't see your answer, so we'll proceed to the third case. And the yes, Kate, and uh, I want to want to add yeah, that I, I said earlier, it is very important in the contracts to define who is in control over the personal data, because the person who will who is in control will be act usually as data controller. <laughs> of course, yeah. thank you, thank you for your input. Yeah. So the next case. Oh, in the, the German yeah, case, yeah. I heard you talking about it with the colleagues and I would like to hear more about it. Yeah, I chose this case because it is very interesting and it is very useful for IT outsourcing relationship. Why? Uh, because it's real life and uh, <laughs> it's, um, uh, it, it concerns the data processor and data controller uh, relationship. Mm -hmm. So, the German case, this case took place in December 2018. Uh, in this case, to, to, to sh the short summary uh, at first. So, the small German shipping company has violated Article 83 of the GDPR by failing to provide a data processing uh, contract. And this company was fined in the amount of 5,000 euros. And just as a caveat, please uh, note that according to our information as of April uh, 2019, this penalty notice has been withdrawn because the violation of the GDPR had been committed before the GDPR came into force. But despite the withdrawal of the case, of the privacy notice, this case is very useful for your IT outsourcing business. And so, why it's again? The, wait, 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 wait a minute okay, and okay, you, okay, and you, wait, and you wait, all wait. understand. So, uh, the baseline in this case, the German shipping company transfers personal data to the postal service provider. But the postal service provider rejected to sign a data processing agreement. And uh, then the German shipping company uh, made uh, a request to the, to the Data Protection Authority of Hesse. Hesse is uh, a federal unit in Germany, okay. asking how to deal with uh, postal service provider who didn't want to sign a data processing agreement. But the Data Protection Authority didn't answer and fi find this uh, company. So, the legal aspects in this case that uh, GDPR states that processing of personal data shall always be covered by a contract uh, between the data controller and the data processor. Still, I have a question. 
And even if, uh, when, when we are talking about legal acts, we see something is uh, in an electronic, maybe in a written form. We can read about it in a, in a gazette, uh, for official gazette, yeah. or in a journal, or we make it, we see on the website of the parliament. Okay, but what about the contract? Make you, can we can I say that we had an oral contract with my processor? Isn't this safe for me? Uh, no. Why? <laughs> because. Uh, uh, so, so basically, I have a, I, I'm a controller and yep. I have a processor I work yep. a long, long, long works with, work with like for many for ten years I guess uh, before the GDPR and uh, we always worked and we worked uh, for so long I could trust him with my own personal data like this and uh, where is the time comes and uh, the uh, data protection authority uh, knocks in my door. Uh, and say and ask me where is the contract between you and your processor? And I'm saying, huh, we have an oral contract. You can see with we have we acknowledge your, uh, our responsibilities. We divided our duties, and we are working. We are working for so long. We have an oral contract and full understanding of each other. So can it be okay? No, having the contract Why? is an obligatory requirement of the GDPR, and you should always take this requirement into account when you, uh, when you working with your business partners. It mustn't be written. Uh, yes, it might be written. Okay. Thank you. So uh, I analyzed the legal basis and. Uh, as I said, GDPR requires a mandatory uh, written contract or other legal act, but other legal act concerns the public authority and uh, it doesn't matter for the private uh, business. So, <clears throat> a contract. But in such a case, there is, uh, the, um, there is no uh, contract between the data controller and the data processor and, and this leading the data protection authority to conclude that the transfer of personal data was made without the proper legal basis in place. And of course, Data Protection Authority find the German, uh, find the German shipping company in the amount of 5,000 of euros. So, which conclusions can be made for your IT outsourcing businesses based on their, on this case? First of all, first, uh, first conclusion. The GDPR applies not only to big companies such as Google and Facebook, but also to the small and medium business. The, small, uh, the GDPR small fines are seldom reported by media, however, there, there is a lot of small companies that has been fined. And the small businesses must adhere to the same high standards of personal data protection. And the second provision that um, in you, in your IT outsourcing relationship, should always conclude a data processing agreement with your uh, suppliers of services, with, uh, with your services suppliers, actually. So, we recommend you to conclude a special data processing agreement or include data processing clauses in your outsourcing contract. So, we, I have two things to say to you. At first, Anton asked our listeners, would they sign a contract with processor? And they said yes. <laughs> so I guess we succeeded. Yep. And then we have a question from Carolina. Carolina, hi. About the contracts, how much time should we have to keep them? While well, we have, we are working with a company person or specific time, like five years. How do you think? Um, you should conclude and you should work in accordance with data processing agreement. Uh, uh, before before the end of provision of services relating to data processing uh, to data processing activities. So, uh, uh, but uh, please be advised that your uh, national law may prescribe some uh, uh, some other rules. For example, maybe some tax, maybe uh, some no, accounting. I, I don't know real like cases. No. Oh, uh, so no. I guess it will depend on the member state law. Yeah. Yep. Of course. Thank you, and we will be proceeding to the end of this our webinar. Do, did you like it? Okay, of course. We are waiting for your questions. I like it a lot, a lot, a lot. And while you are working, you are writing your, com your comments, and maybe you have some questions left, uh, we will um, drop a line, we'll make a conclusions what we have talked about today. And uh, 
So first of all, GDPR compliance requires strategic thinking. You can't just uh, wait for occasion to write it. You have to care for it as you care for any other areas of your operation of your company, like accountancy, like the legal com compliance in general, like the tax responsibilities maybe. So you have to think about what uh, uh, what your alliance will result in in like five years and maybe three years or even several months what if the data breach will occur or will uh we'll have a data subject who is really, really interested in his rights so there is legal discipline you have to be so the second conclusion is what what about andre or it's uh, what about andre side yeah the company side does not really matter yeah no, as I said, it is, it is previous case. Uh, company size doesn't affect its liability, and even small companies uh, bear the full liability under the GDPR. But uh, uh, it's in real life, the small clients just seldom just uh, are seldom uh, reported by media, and uh, a lot of people <laughs> don't know about these facts. Oh, so media is our is our and how I can say is light back i guess in this yeah. darkness of data yeah. breaches so uh, the next conclusion we can make is that one document you developed or one document you have uh, find somewhere on the internet cannot help you entirely one size fits all doesn't work in this case especially because the gpr details are depending on your business model on your processors on your maybe storages like when you are using cloud computing and so on and so on and in the end, privacy issues are tricky. Why is they are tricky? I think because the GPR document is very, uh, very big. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 99 articles, and this is a really challenging to 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 to, to understand all these provisions. And uh, the biggest challenge is to implement all these provisions provisions in your company and in the really daily activities of your business. Operations. For example, we have a question. Yep. One last question, and we have to say goodbyes. So Marina asks us. Hi, Marina. Uh, what about informing EU controls every time Ukrainian source or some contract changes? So we have talked uh, earlier that it depends on the contract. We have a general, maybe some contract about the notification. We maybe have some uh, specific, maybe we have not mentioned it in the contract. But what we have to do as an, uh, for example, as a CEO of uh, ATL sourcing company in Ukraine, when we change our subcontracts, how we notify the general country of controller or not? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for question, Marina. And um, yes, it's uh, it's really difficult to uh, to, to to inform every co European Union control controllers every time of the change of the processors. But it is requirement of the GPR, and we can't do anything uh, anything else. So basically, what would I do in this yeah. case? I would uh, at first I would see what is written in my uh, contract with the controller. Okay. Because there must be clause about the notification, for example, general authorization or something like that. And then I would see in the root of the GDPR. Uh, of course, the GDPR says that in case uh, you change your con you change your sub processors, you have to notify the controller so to enable enable him to object and thus to control the, the flows of data. But uh, there, are, there may be some differences uh, and, or some maybe additional obligations regarding the, uh, member, the member state law. So I can say that there is, a, there is a demand rule. You have to, you have to go with, this, with it, only with it, and consider nothing else. But we have to consider on a case-by-case case case state, state <coughs> basis. I'm sorry. So, <clears throat> if you have a special question about maybe in, uh, a specific jurisdiction, we would like to hear your concerns in our uh, to our email, and maybe we can help you. We'll be very very glad to. So, thank you guys. We will, I hope you enjoyed our webinar as much as we do. Yes. And uh, I hope so. We will uh, meet next time, of course. And I hope we could. Uh, we could, we could become friends with you and we will be waiting for all the webinars. Uh, subscribe us to the YouTube, so we read our blog maybe, and we will be really, really glad to see you again. So, yeah, see you. See you.